Good morning! How is everybody today? It's always encouraging to see everyone uh, worship with us uh, this morning. And if you would like to stand with us, please, as we sing, we are going to please stand up if you would like. Uh, we are going to say grace on top of grace. Please sing with us. And you can put your hands together. Stop your feet if you want. God is alive. You know, we serve a living God. And let's worship Him in the living way. Amen. Put your hands together like this. Here we go.
Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Hallelujah. Thank
once we were broken, but you mended us, Father. You mend us piece by piece. You have gathered us, Father, so you can put your life into us. For us as a vessel, Father, we would like to contain you. We would, if we pray, Father, that you uh, make us this vessel overflowing with your life. And teach us, Father, to, to be obedient to you and loving you more and more each day. Father, thank you so much for your love, unending love, Father. We want to thank you, Father. We want to say we love you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you so much for all your blessings. We just want to give you all the praise and the glory, Father. Thank you so much for everything. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody says amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Oh, you guys are more awake than first service. <laughs> we have had a great week at Living Hope this week. We had Summer Kids Jam Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, and we played hard. My goodness. Um, our volunteers just kept loving on those kids nonstop till, the, till it was done. And uh, we got to tell them about Jesus, and three children accepted Christ as their Savior this week. Yes, absolutely. So that's just one of the ways um, at Living Hope Church that we do life together. We just show up and we give what we have, whether that's a few minutes to play or, uh, you know, just giving a smile, being with someone or an opportunity to actually talk to a child and pray with a child. Um, and there's a couple things coming up this week that you can do that. You can be involved um, in opportunities like that. Wednesday night is hashtag impact together, and you'll be hearing about these all summer, but this week, uh, meet at the church, and we've got two or three projects that we're doing that include um, some yard work and painting a garage, cleaning out some gutters, so we'll need some people who are not afraid to get up on ladders, and um, I think we're helping someone pack, too, and get ready to move. So when we do our service together and we do it out of love, it, is, it, it becomes an act of worship, and it's a reflection of who Jesus is. And we do it with no strings attached, because that's how Jesus loves us. And um, I want you to make a note, though, so pay attention. Here's a special notice to remember. We're changing the time. It's going to be from 6 to 8 p.m. So that gives you a little bit more time if you're finishing work, grab some supper, and then still be able to come and join us. So make a note of that. And then next Sunday is Father's Day. And uh, we love our dads. Dads love a challenge, and they especially love it when they can do a challenge with their families. So bring dad to church next Sunday, and we're going to do some ch lawn challenge games, um, make some memories, and give dad a chance to win a gift card to the Primetime Tavern that just opened recently in Madison. So if we can pull up this picture on the screen, uh, another challenge we're going to have is called a wheelie bad mixed drinks challenge. No alcohol involved, so don't worry about that. But this picture will give you a little bit of an idea of what you can come and dare dad to try. So I'm also looking for some volunteers to help with this game and other challenges. So if you got the email this week, you can respond to that or you can make a note on your connection card if you want to help. One more thing. Some people have asked, how can we give to the volcano victims and help out in Guatemala? And um, there is an opportunity for you today with these envelopes. If you get an, uh, an envelope from an usher on your way out of the service this morning, anything received in these envelopes today uh, will go to Leah's kids, and they will forward that on to people who, can, um, who will need the help in Guatemala. So make your checks out to Living Hope, and we'll go ahead and process that and send that on to Leah's kids. But anything received today in these envelopes will go to help um, with the volcano disaster relief there. So, lots of information, so we're going to do a little review. What day is Hashtag Impact Together? Wednesday. What time? Wednesday. Where do we meet? Wednesday. All right. And who's going to join me? This is the part where you say, I am. So who's going to join me? Okay, <laughs> there's some people out there. And is Father's Day at Living Hope going to be fun? Are you going to be here? All right, you guys did way better than first service, so thank you. Keep listening. Pastor Andrew's going to come and continue its series with Following Jesus. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good. Normally weird. David, all right. <laughs> 
Well, we are in week number four of our series entitled Following, where we've just been looking at for the last few weeks what Jesus has to say. It means to truly follow him. And so we've been walking through the Gospels and looking at his life and his ministry and trying to figure out what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus, what it truly means to be a Christian today. And so today we're going to be continuing that conversation. We're going to be talking about something that might make people a little bit uncomfortable, to be honest. So I want to get that out of the way right out in the open here. Today we're going to be talking about money and our finances and looking at what Jesus has to tell us about that. So let's just get that out of the way, get the uncomfortableness out of the way, and let's just all agree to look at something that Jesus thought was so important that he spent a lot of time talking about it. If you don't believe me, take a gander through the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll find out that Jesus spent a lot of time talking about money. And why? Because he knows us. He knows the human condition. And so today, as we get ready to talk about money, I want to continue also letting you guys in on a little bit of my story, my background. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you've been getting to know me a little bit better. I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing for you guys. You tell me. But most of you know now, if you've been the last couple weeks, that I grew up going to church. And most weeks, I would see my parents as offering plates go by. I would see them dropping in some money, or I guess most of the time they were probably writing checks and putting them in a little envelope that had their name on it and everything and dropping it in. And for me, I just knew growing up that that's what you did. If you're a Christian, if you went to church, you gave back to the church. And my parents even tried to instill this in us as kids that giving was important. And so as we got jobs or as we started earning money, babysitting, mowing lawns, whatever it might be, they started to encourage us to give back just a little bit of what we got as well so we could learn the importance of giving back. But quite honestly, I never really understood why we were doing it. And as I've shared in past weeks, as I got into high school and college age, I spent quite a few years not going to church. Again, not because I saw anything inherently wrong with church, not because I didn't believe in God or was walking away from God. I still very much believed in God, but I just never really got it. I never really understood the point. I believe in God. What does going to church really mean? And so I spent several years not going to church. And then I found this church. Actually, God urged me one week to find a church again. And by his grand ordained plan, that same week, a pastor showed up at my door knocking. I didn't even have a chance to go and start looking for churches, but a pastor showed up at my door and said, hey, we just planted a church up the road. And so this church that I started attending started to really teach me, both through Sunday mornings and through me getting involved in my very first small group, my bi first Bible study, started to help me to understand who God truly was. See, I discovered that I had created for myself a different God than the God of Scripture. From not really ever reading my Bible and spending so many years not going to church, when I was in church growing up, I never really understood what the pastor was saying most of the time. And so I had created for myself, based off of one notion, that God is a God of love, which is true, that my human understanding of love made me put all my own characteristics on God, saying, well, if God loves me, then he wants me to be happy. I think we've all tried to reconcile that, right? And what I'm doing makes me happy, so God must be okay with it. And as I really started to understand who God was, and through my Bible study, they taught me how to, to really study God's word and read it and be able to pull stuff out of it that's applicable to our lives, telling me who God is and who God's created each and every one of us to be. I discovered a truth, a truth that I had not known before about money and about tithing and about giving and see, I had always thought that tithing was a concept that the church had came up with. I had never really heard anybody talk about it. 
you know, from, from Jesus' standpoint or from God or from any of the books of the Bible, at least that I had remembered hearing about. And I just thought that that was something that the church had mandated. Give 10% to the church. That's just what you're supposed to do. So we can pay for stuff, do ministry, help people out. That's what I thought. But as I was in my own personal study one night, I discovered a truth in here. That tithing is actually very much a biblical concept. That giving back to God is really throughout this entire book, Old Testament, New Testament, together. Jesus talks about it as well. And as a matter of fact, it goes all the way back to almost the very beginning in Genesis where we see Cain and Abel giving back their first fruits, giving back to God part of what he has given them as an offering of thanks, a thank offering to God. Not only for giving them the very breath that they breathe, their very lives, but also for giving them everything that he has blessed them with. So they give back a portion of the fruits of their labor. And as we read through the Old Testament, we see this becomes part of the law and God lays out the guidelines for if you want to live holy and blameless lives, these are the things that you should do. And we see that tithing becomes part of that law as well. And as I started to discover this, I really felt God just urging me to start tithing. See, I had been, I had been going to church and starting to understand who God was and, and as I was raised to give back some, I was giving a little bit. But what I was doing was giving just a few extra bucks that I had in my pocket that I thought I had left over that I could spare that I didn't need to live on. And God started to, to really work in me and I wanted to start tithing. I really did. And so I was actually pretty good at budgeting and I was pretty good at not spending more than I needed to, being pretty tight and frugal with my money. So I started to go through all the numbers, walk through what my income was and my expenses, and I started adding it all up and going, man, I just don't have enough to tithe. So I tried to cut things out and thin it out as much as I could, and in the end, I was still in the same spot going, man, I really just don't have enough to give that 10%, but I really, really want to. And what I realized was I was living on about 99.9 and then sometimes 105% of my income. <laughs> and I tried to figure out a way to make it work, but I couldn't. So wanting to tithe, I continued to not tithe. And I'd give just a couple bucks here and there when I had it. Most of the time, I didn't have hardly anything to give. And I wonder, how many of you have been or are in a similar position? Where you wish you could give more, you wish you could tithe, but you look at your finances and you say, man, I just don't know how I can come up with that. Maybe you're like me, because my answer was, well, as soon as I get a raise, then I'll have more, and then I can tithe, right? Then I can get back to God. But we've all been down that road, right? As soon as you get that raise, which I did, still don't have any money. Where am I spending it on? We end up spending a lot of times, no matter how much we're making. Now, obviously, there's limits where we hit that, where eventually we make so much money. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. But I wonder how many of you are in a position like that where you wish you could be given more, whether to church or to something else. You wish you could be given more, but you just can't make the numbers work. You can't figure out how you could actually afford to give a larger amount or that 10% of your income. And maybe some of you are even back here further where I was at haven't really thought about it. think it's something that the church had made up. But as you discover that it's not, and I encourage you all to just to study that on your own, walk through God's word and see what he would tell you. As you consider that, 
We want to look at a passage today in Mark chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 12. We'll be starting in verse 41. If you don't have your Bibles with you, there should be Bibles under the seats in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, please feel free to take one of these. It's our gift to you. It's so important that you have God's word in your homes, at your fingertips, so you can continue to learn who he is, develop that relationship that we just want you to have that. So, Also, if you have a smartphone or a tablet with you, you can follow along in the YouVersion app. Otherwise, we'll have it on the screen as well. So plenty of ways to follow along. So please do that while I read out loud. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts, but then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Now we're going to stop there for a moment and let's just let's try and wrap our minds around this scene. Wrap our minds around what's really going on there. See, Jesus... He went to the temple that day. And where he's actually at here is a temple court. So it's actually outside of the sanctuary. And he sits himself in plain view of one of which there were 13 of these collection boxes in this court of women is where he's actually at. And he just sits down there and watches. And it says that there was, he watched as crowds of people dropped in their money. So I can only imagine that this is probably like their regular service time, their regular meeting, their regular gathering to come and hear the message for the day and sing songs. So there's crowds of people. So Jesus is not sitting there waiting for a person to come up, a specific person, but he's just watching as the crowds are dropping in their money. Now I don't know about you, but if I'm bringing in my offering and I'm walking up with this money, it's going to make me, I'm going to feel pretty awkward. This guy's just kind of sitting there staring at me. You're like, what are you doing, man? What's this guy doing over here? And you can imagine what the disciples are thinking, right? What's he up to now? You're just sitting there staring at these people, dropping their money in. Who knows? Peter's probably like, don't we got better things to do? <laughs> But Jesus sits down, and if we've learned anything over the last few weeks, everything he does is on purpose. Everything he does is for a reason. So he sits, and he waits. And it says that he watches as many rich people put in large amounts. And you'd be able to tell who these rich people are, usually by the way they're dressed, and by what they were carrying in. You see, at this time, there were no checkbooks, there were no credit cards, and there was also no paper money. So they were carrying in, more likely in sacks, because it's really hard to carry a bunch of coins like this, I suppose. But everything was coins. And so they would be carrying in their offerings. And so you'd be able to see who was rich, not only by their appearance, by what they were carrying, but you'd also be able to tell what they were giving, even without looking. You see, the collection boxes mentioned here are what are called trumpet chests. And they're rightfully named because at the top, they were pretty narrow, and they were made of a metal, like a bronze or a copper, something that looks like a trumpet, and it would come down like, much like a trumpet does and span out. And then that sat on top of a wooden box that, where the money collected. And so what I found out in my research about these collection boxes, about these trumpet chests, is that when people would drop in the money, it would actually make a lot of noise. More noise depending upon if they were dropping in a lot, less noise if they were dropping in a little, but it would clang hitting the sides of this trumpet. And then when it would hit the rest of the coins in the bottom, it would also make a noise that would resound out. So you would be able to tell what people are given while having a conversation over here. You could probably hear, oh, big donation, clang, clang, clang. And you can just imagine the priests 
and the temple workers rejoicing and praising these people who are given the large donations because man, think of all the good we can do, how much we can build, how many people we can bless, the orphans and the widows. But then this poor woman, this poor widow, she came amongst the crowds, crowds of rich people, drops in two small coins. Now let's put ourselves in that widow's place for a moment. Now I looked just to be sure, but the original word used there for poor speaks of like, not, oh, what a poor little baby, what a poor little puppy, but poor. She lived in poverty. She was destitute. She had nothing. That's the word that was used to describe this widow. And so you can imagine the rich people dressed in all their glorious robes. And then this widow coming in, probably dressed in rags. Her hair's probably not done up real well. She's probably not wearing a bunch of makeup. She doesn't have anything. She's not in her Sunday best. She's not wearing heels. She comes in dressed like you would expect to see someone who has nothing and is absolutely poor. And you can imagine the courage that that took for her to walk in amongst those crowds of all these rich people, knowing that she's probably going to be receiving dirty looks. The shame that she probably was forced upon her by culture walking into that place and probably the under the breath snide remarks that were being made as she walked in. People probably thinking, man, she's going to come and take her money. She's coming in asking for a handout. But this woman goes against what everybody's thinking. She drops in two small coins. Now at this point, I can only imagine that if, if all eyes weren't already on her, when those coins went in, and hit the sides and the bottom, and there was just a simple little tick, tick. Instead of the loud crash and celebratory clanging that the big offerings made, you can only imagine that the eyes of everyone else who weren't watching were on her at this time. See, this room was not very big. It was about 200 square feet, much smaller than the room we're in now. So you can imagine that everyone was able to hear the offerings. And see, the coins of this time, unlike our goofy American money, they were actually valued by their size. The large coins were worth more. Small coins were worth less. None of this, a dime is worth more than a nickel and a penny, which are both bigger than it. It wasn't like that. And so they were smaller they made less noise when they went in. The bigger coins made more noise, a bigger when they hit. So the very sound would have told them someone just put in like nothing, next to nothing, and would have probably gotten people to turn and put their eyes on her as well as Jesus was already watching. And Jesus saw this as a teaching moment. Because in verse 43, Jesus called to his disciples. He called them to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. Now at this point, if you're one of the disciples, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, say what? These guys who just gave like thousands of dollars? You're telling me that the two pennies she threw in is more than what they gave? What were those coins? I mean, they were small. I know they were small. Were they some new production coin? What were? They? How could they possibly be worth more than all the big donations they were giving? And Jesus goes on to tell them, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she as poor as she is, she has given everything that she had to live on. Jesus says, the reason that it's more 
is because these people, they live on a small amount of their income. They have a lot left over. And out of that excess, out of what's left over after they've paid all their bills, bought all their groceries, paid all their workers, they give this small amount out of that excess. Yet she has given absolutely everything she had to live on. Now we, normal people, could not know that about her. We could probably look at her and make some assumptions. Say, well, she really doesn't appear to have hardly anything. But Jesus, see, she knows this woman the same way he knows each and every one of us. He knows us intimately and everything about us. And he knows and tells us that she just gave everything that she had to live on. What courage did this woman have? Not only to walk through to give what would have helped them do nothing. These two coins were actually worth depending upon the resource you look at, between about five and seven minutes worth of labor. Think about that in your own context and tell me how much that can buy you. Not much, right? And this woman walks in. Despite all those dirty looks, the shame she knew they were trying to force upon her. She drops in everything she had to live on. That's something else. (laughs) See, this passage, it's not really even talking about money. Quite honestly, I've heard a lot of people, pastors in fact, take this passage and turn it into something that says that Jesus was actually speaking against what the rich people, what the Pharisees, what the teachers of the law here were giving. And saying that God did not even honor what they gave. But to tell you the truth, I don't see that at all. If there's anything that I've realized, and hopefully you guys have as well, if you've been here for the last few weeks, is that Jesus has no problem telling it exactly like it is and confronting people about what they're doing right or wrong. Often it seems like they're doing it wrong, doesn't it? And as a matter of fact, what we did not read, but I encourage you to go back and read that as well, the passage right before this in Mark, Jesus just got done telling the religious leaders, the Pharisees, to stop showing off in their glorious robes and all their get up. But here he doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't say, oh, you terrible gifts that you give. God does not honor them. But he does contrast which one was more. Because he's turning all of their thinking. Everyone in that room, you can bet, is thinking, well, $1,000 is, is worth way more than the two pennies she threw in. That's what I'd be thinking. But Jesus, wanting to teach them what giving to God is all about, he makes this comparison. He contrasts the two and says, she gave everything What does that have to do with what the others gave? What's the difference between this poor widow and all the rich who just gave out of a tiny surplus? The amounts are different, so you think that they're giving a lot more, right? But Jesus says, no, it's the other way around. Like I said, he's not talking about money really at all. See, Jesus looks through all of that he looks at the heart of people. And what this woman had that these others did not was a trust in God that goes beyond most of our imagination. Most of us could never dream of giving absolutely everything we have to live on. Again, did God honor 
what they were giving? It doesn't really say either way, but it doesn't, Jesus does not say that God did not honor what the rich people gave. And quite honestly, tradition tells us, and knowing the people of this time, that they were giving their full tithe, at least. Because Pharisees, the people that they're talking about here, they were good at living out the letter of the law to the T. And as a matter of fact, they were given more than 10% because at this time, there were several different tithes expected to be given. And what it really added up to, what they were expected to give, was about 23.3% of their income. So you can imagine some of these rich people who maybe are living on like 10% of their income and they have all this 90. So to give 10 or 20 or 23.3% of that income, still having so much left compared to this woman who gave literally everything she had to live on, not knowing where her food would come from the next few days, maybe weeks, I don't know. Not knowing how she'd pay for her gas or her electricity. Not knowing how she'd fill up her car. How she'd pay for her rent. She trusted God with everything. Absolutely everything. That's what God is calling us to do. God created us to live in communion with him. To know him in such a way as we know that we can trust our own fathers if you've had a father who you can trust. But he surpasses all fathers that we can imagine. Imagine the best father that you could ever imagine. And you know that you can trust him. That's what God calls us to. To trust him the way this widow does. And that's really what Jesus is trying to tell us there. It's all about trust. See, when I found out that tithing is something that God asks us to do, I started to learn this principle. I really wanted to, but I just couldn't, I couldn't give over the control of my money. I wanted to keep it. But one day, after spending a lot of time wanting to do this, wanting to give, wanting to tithe, and give my first 10% and trust God with the rest, he finally grabbed hold of me and shook me and said, just trust me. Stop relying on your own efforts. Stop relying on money. Take money off the throne that rightfully belongs to me, God says. Because that's where so many of us put it, right? We put money up there and we trust in money. We trust in our own efforts. And if we can see it, if we can actually crunch the numbers and make sure it works, then we'll trust we have enough. We got to believe, we got to see it to believe it rather than the other way around. God grabbed me and he shook me and he said, just trust me and I will provide for you, but you have to trust me. So I took a huge leap of faith and I tithed for the first time ever that week. <laughs> and God showed up. Because I had no idea. As I said, I was living super tight on like 100% of my income. And I took that 10% and I gave it to God first. And I got a check in the mail that same week for 300 and some odd dollars, more than my tithe was. Apparently, my insurance premium for my car insurance had, had dropped. I don't know, maybe I turned older. I don't remember exactly what age I was at that time. But... My insurance premium dropped and apparently they forgot to put it on my statement and let it reflect and so I had been overpaying and not even knowing it. God showed me. I knew right then and there. I've never gotten a check like that before. <laughs> the very week that God says, just trust me and I'll provide for you, he did. So I continued to tithe. And I definitely was not rolling in the dough but God continued to provide for me. 
And the crazy thing was, is the numbers did not add up. I couldn't figure out how I was making it by. But God continued to provide for me. After a while, though, my human capacity took over and I got scared. As I'd go through my budget, I'd get scared and go, I don't know where the money's going to come from. If I keep going like this, I'm not going to make it. So I took that control back. I stopped tithing. I went back to throwing in a few extra bucks if I had it. And things got worse for me. I continued to struggle at making ends meet, trying to figure out how I could do this. Work wasn't letting me do overtime as much anymore. How do I do it? And God grabbed hold of me again and said, man, what's the matter with you? I told you to trust me. I showed you that you could. And then you just take control back over again. You start relying on yourself and your own efforts. He shook me enough for me to say, you're right. I took another giant leap of faith and I tithed again. I started tithing again. And I kid you not, that week, I can't make this stuff up, I got another check in the mail for almost $3,000. It's like $2,943 for my mortgage company this time. My... (laughs) My taxes had gone down quite significantly. It was right at that time where the market had crashed and home values were going down. And apparently it takes a long time for that to reflect in your mortgage and your escrow account. It's like a little over a year, finally, because they don't roll it out only once a year and it had happened prior. And so I get this check in the mail that very same week where God says, just trust me and I'll provide for you. Not only did I get all that money, not only did God show up with all that money, but my mortgage payment, because the taxes had gone down, also went down almost $300 a month. And I have not quit tithing since. And God, despite the fact that that my wife and I have even been in positions where we only had one part-time income coming in. With a brand new baby, God continued to always provide for us. We've always had enough. God calls us to trust in him. and He'll provide for us. We've got to take money off of God's throne. Take our trust in money, tear it down, and put our trust in God. Don't do that expecting to get a check in the mail like I did. Because if that's the motive, it's probably not going to happen. I don't know how God will show you that you can trust him, but I have 100% faith in the fact that he will show you you can trust him to provide if you truly take that leap of faith to trust him. So I want to challenge you. Wherever you're at in your relationship with God, wherever you're at in trusting God, I want to challenge you. If you've never given before, take some time. We'll have some time here in a little bit. The band will play. Take some time to pray and ask God, to put a number on your heart that he would have you give and commit to try that for the next four weeks. Put your trust in God and let him show you what he'll do. If you've been giving, thank you. That's a great step towards trusting in God. But if you've been giving and you've never tried tithing, I want you to take a giant leap of faith and try tithing. Try giving God your first fruits, your first 10%. Trust him to provide for you, even if it means it's coming out of what you have to live on. That's what he's talking about here. Trust. That's what it's all about. It's really not about the money. But we need to trust God with our money. And maybe you're more like 
the rich people in this story and you live on such a small percentage of your income that you've been tithing and that's easy and you got it on auto tithe and it doesn't take much trust at all. First of all, thank you for being faithful in that because it allows us as a church body to do so many great things, to help so many people out like through this impact together we've been talking about, to help so many people in this community, single mothers, widows, orphans in this community and with other organizations that we've partnered with around the globe. But maybe you've been doing that and you've never really tested God. You never really went out of your bubble to trust God enough. I want to challenge you too. Try giving above and beyond that and see what God would show you about trusting him. I promise that he will show up if you go to him with the motives that are right. And that is to trust him and develop your relationship with him. So let's pray together about that. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord, for, for allowing us to know you, Lord, for allowing us to come to you, to put our trust in you, Lord. That's not easy. Giving up control over our lives, specifically over our money, Lord, is something that is so, so difficult to do, Lord. We trust in what we can see. We trust in what we can do, Lord. But you call us to trust in you, our creator. So, Father, I just pray that you would help every one of us to trust in you, Lord. To tear down idols we put up on our lives, idols that we trust in over you, to put you where you belong, number one in our lives, Lord. I pray that as the band comes and plays, Lord, and they sing about awakening, that you would just help every one of us to spend a little time in reflection with you, Lord. Place on each one of our hearts what you would have us do that stretches us to trust in you and not ourselves. And then help us to give you the praise and the glory of what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before the band plays and you get that time for reflection and prayer, there's someone else who really wanted to share their story about money and about tithing with you. So, would you guys check out this video? When Wade and I first moved to Sioux Falls, I set up home daycare. Imagine that. And I had one kid other than my own that was coming to my daycare and I was going to church and I decided this isn't working you know one one kid at my daycare I can't survive on that and so I went out on a limb in my mind and I said I'm gonna start tithing on this so the $87 that I was getting a week from that family, I wrote my check for $8.70 and I put it in the offering plate and then I went the next week and I put my $8.70 in the offering plate and then the next week I got phone calls that I had kids that wanted to start coming to my daycare and they did, and over the course of the next month, I went from one kid in my daycare to 12 children in my daycare, and I continued tithing on the amount because, you know, it was one of those, I tested God, and he proved me, you know, proved to me what he says he will do, you know. If you do what he asks, he blesses you, and it happened, and so, that was the first time around that I tested him. And then um, 
this last year when Pastor Brian did the series on tithing and that stuff, I decided I have two jobs and you know we tithe and that kind of stuff on the main job but the second job was just kind of my frou-frou play money and you know Pastor Brian said trust God, tithe, do it. So I started tithing on that second job's money. In the financial part of it, it used to be you paid the bills and if there was something left over, you gave to the church. And now, like I said, you know, with the, the tip thing that I don't even, you know, it's here's the tips, you put it in the envelope, it, it's not even part of your budget equation. You know, it's just, it's automatically there. And like I said, I now have more. So it, if you put God first, in the end, you have more than enough. continue to reflect about the message
for coming this morning we pray and hope that we would practice following Jesus and uh, uh, practicing and trusting him and in your way out there's a bucket there on your way out please don't forget to drop your connection cards and practicing the, the giving uh, tithes and offering thank you so much God bless we're dismissed